welcome to everyone to our ACAT transfer information session today. Um, we are super happy that you are all joining us. My name is Danielle. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. Uh, and today I'm going to be speaking to you about transferring into the Faculty of Engineering. On the call today, we are fortunate enough to have Jessica, who is from our Engineering Student Services. And we also have Kylie and Mikhail today, who are representatives from our Engineering Student Society, which is super cool. So they'll be able to answer any student-focused questions you have later on. Uh, now, in terms of questions, we do kindly request that you save all of your questions for the end of the presentation. We are going to have time for a pretty lengthy Q&A session. Um, you can utilize the Q&A function to input any questions you may have, um, and then others can upvote the same questions so we can make sure that we're answering the most asked questions first um, when we get to that Q&A session. Feel free to add those questions in as we are going through the presentation. Just note that your question may be answered through the presentation or um, yeah, we may get to it through the presentation as well. They also will not be looked at until the end of the presentation. So just note that we won't answer them until that point. So I am presenting to you today from Edmonton, Alberta, home to the University of Alberta. The University of Alberta does acknowledge that we are located on Treaty 6 territory and respects the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. Now, there are so many cool and amazing reasons to study at the University of Alberta, to name a few. Our institution is ranked as a top five university in Canada and among the top 110 in the world. The first U of A engineering class started in 1908 with only five students, and the faculty was later established in 1913. With over 100 years of excellence, we have over 4,000 undergraduate students and some 1,500 graduate students with 800 graduates each year, making us one of the largest engineering programs in North America. When it comes to our engineering programs, we are ranked as number one in Canada for petroleum engineering with electrical, civil, and mechanical also within the top 10. Globally, our mining engineering program is ranked as top 10 and chemical engineering is number one nationally as well. So why should you choose engineering at the U of A? We have received maximum accreditation for all programs in the Canadian Engineering Accreditation Board for the last six years and are the only accredited petroleum engineering school in Canada. We are fully APEGA, the Association of Professional Engineers and Geoscientists and Engineers Canada accredited four times. And we have $1.5 million in student scholarships annually. So definitely put yourself out there, apply for those scholarships. There's tons of money to go around to you students. We also have very strong long-standing ties to the industry. For example, PCL and Stantec are both companies founded and run by U of A alumni. We also have a world-renowned reputation for research with more than $65 million in external research funding per year. Our professors are some of the best in the world and we have the oldest co-op program in Western Canada and one of the largest. So lots of great things that we can be proud of here at U of A. The Faculty of Engineering is proud to call the University of Alberta's North Campus home. This is where you're gonna find all of our amazing facilities. North Campus is also only minutes away from Edmonton's iconic White Avenue, which offers some pretty unique shops, really good eats, uh, great spots to hang out with some fellow classmates and friends off campus. Many students as well on North Campus choose to live on campus. Living on campus can lead to higher GPA, definitely some more fun, not missing out on those 8 a.m. classes. <laughs> um, zero commute time is a big benefit of living on campus. And then definitely meeting new friends, hanging out with those friends, and joining some great clubs, which our um, Engineering Student Society can definitely chat about later. For more information on residents specifically, please visit uab.ca slash residents. They can answer all of your questions and everything to do with housing on campus. Now we have some pretty cool engineering facilities on campus as well. The Donadeo Innovation Center for Engineering, aka DICE. There's going to be lots of different acronyms that you're going to hear about in all of our engineering facilities. Um, this is where you're going to find engineering student services, support centers, and is located in our engineering quad on North Campus. We also have various discipline-specific buildings, such as our mechanical engineering building, the chemical and materials engineering building, and the electrical and computing engineering building. Um, our other engineering facilities include the machine shop 
and the National Institute for Nanotechnology, which houses the Nano Lab, which is one of the largest in Canada. You can take a tour um, of all of these facilities by visiting uab.ca slash tours and book a tour to visit North Campus, check out these different facilities and ask some questions about them. Now, one of the big facilities that we love to highlight is the Elko Engineering Garage. It's a 6,000 foot square foot work space um, equipped with 3D printers, virtual reality welding station, automated laser cutters, <laughs> it's super cool space. And it's located on the second floor of the Engineering Teaching and Learning Complex, which we also call ETLC. Now, the Faculty of Engineering offers 21 fully accredited undergraduate programs resulting in a Bachelor of Science and Engineering degree. Once you have successfully transferred from your first year, uh, you're going to begin your studies in an engineering discipline such as electrical, computer, chemical, and so, so much more. At the U of A, you can complete your studies in the traditional stream, meaning you can take classes during regulated school semesters, um, as you would any other degree program, or you can complete your degree in the co-op route, where you get the opportunity to gain work experience while you study. Uh, the Faculty of Engineering also offers plenty of graduate programs, such as master's, PhD studies, if you wish to continue studying after your undergraduate degree. I'm now going to pass off this presentation to Jessica to speak more on the specifics of transferring. Hello. Um, yeah, my name is Jessica Stevens. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I'm the team lead in the Undergraduate Student Services Office in Engineering. So um, when you apply to engineering, your, your application will come across my desk um, as part of the review process. So the basic requirements to transfer into engineering at the U of A from your, um, from your transfer program, you will, um, sorry, we require a minimum of 2.3 GPA and that is a fall winter GPA. So your fall winter average, and then you're required to complete a minimum of 30 engineering units by the end of spring term. So um, I know it can be a little bit tricky because a lot of the programs, the transfer programs are not in engineering units. So if you have specific questions about that, you can contact us, um, or you can also look at the, uh, in the U of A calendar, we have our units there. And then as long as you know what your courses are um, that match our courses, you'll be able to figure out your units that way. Okay, so yes, if you meet these two requirements, you're guaranteed admission um, into a second year discipline. What discipline that is will depend on, um, will depend on the ranking, which is based on your GPA. So um, there's, I think, I don't know if it's on the next page. Um, I'll, I, I, I'll talk about it on the next slide, I think. So you, if you haven't already applied, apply by March 1st for fall 2024. And then we want to have all of your official transcripts um, basically everything on your checklist completed by June 15th. And when you apply to our program, you're going to just be applying to engineering, um, not to a specific discipline. That's where you'll fill out the program selection form. And that form will open for you on February 1st, and then it will close on April 30th. And then we open it again for two weeks in the at the beginning of June, just in case you have, you know, second thoughts, you, you know, thought you wanted to be a mechanical engineer, but you've done more research and now you think chemicals the way to go. Um, we do give you that bit of time to make any changes to your selections. Um, there isn't any, we get this question a lot, but there isn't, there aren't any tricks or anything to the program selection form. You really just want to rank them in order of what you want to get into. So if you know you want to be in mechanical, you're gonna put the five mechanical routes as your first five choices. Um, the minimum to get into a co-op program is the 2.3, and then the minimum to get into a traditional program is a 2.0. So the averages may be higher than that because it is dependent on the application group. So all of our first year students and all of you as transfer students. So some co-op routes may be a higher, higher than a 
um, but that is the minimum. So if you're hoping for co-op, you can put co-op as your first two choices and then the traditional programs after that, it's, um, it's up to you. And I'll talk about co-op a bit more in a minute. Okay, so um, the other part of admission that can seem a little bit tricky, but it's, it's a basic, you know, math, math calculation. Um, all students start with 37 engineering units. So again, I know that your units may be different than our units, but we're basing it on our engineering units, which is 37. All students um, have 40.6 units. And then we remove the Eng 100 and Eng 160. That brings you down to 37.5 units. And then we base the calculation on 37 units. So, um, and again, if you have questions about this at the end, I can definitely answer them like a bit more specific, specific examples. But basically it just means that if you, if you decide to withdraw from a course, so um, you're struggling in, your Chem 105 next term and you decide to withdraw from it, we're gonna take, um, we're gonna subtract that from the 37.5 units and then um, multiply however many units below 37 units you are by 0 0.05. And that gives you what we call a path, which is the program admission factor. So the reason why we do this is because everybody needs to be ranked on the same criteria. So students that withdraw from a course, your load is lighter. Therefore, we, we calculate this program admission factor just so that it, it evens everybody out. Um, so again, if you have more questions about that, I can answer them at the end. Um, another part two is the transferability of your courses. So for the program, um, sorry, for the completed units, we will include a D um, from your institution in the completed units because you did pass the course at your institution. Um, but in order for the course to transfer, you do have to have a minimum C minus. So um, you, would need to, you would need to retake that course once you come to the U of A if you get a D, but we will include it in the completed units. If you, Oh, right. And then I kind of talked about this already, but if you withdraw from any classes or take less than the required 12 first year courses, you will get a program admission factor calculated on your GPA. The, um, the program admission factor is strictly for uh, discipline ranking and placement. It's not listed anywhere on your transcript. It's just an internal calculation that we do in order to rank and place you in a discipline in the summer. Okay, so these are all of our engineering disciplines. So we have, um, Danielle gave you, gave you the details, but we have a lot of different programs. Um, some of the best programs in the world. Um, we're continually looking to expand our programs. Um, we're hoping this year actually that we're gonna be adding two new chemical streams, which will hopefully be um, released before you apply to the program. So we'll give you updates on that as well, but we're looking at two new chemical streams. And then all of our programs offer the co-op and traditional routes with the exception of um, computer software. Computer software only has a co-op option. There isn't a traditional route for that program. And um, as well as the mechanical biomedical. So the biomedical stream um, has, has a co-op only option. There isn't a traditional route. And then we also get questions sometimes about biomedical streams in other programs. And currently the only biomedical program we're offering is through mechanical. Okay, so co-op. Co-op is, um, again, we're one, of, we're one of the best in the, in the country. So basically how the co-op program works is that your program is extended by one year so instead of a four-year program, which includes your first year that you're in right now, your program is extended to five years. And basically we have 20 months of paid work experience um, put in, in between your academic terms from starting you know, as early as winter term of second year, depending on what discipline you get into for co-op. 
So all of these are paid. We have, you have a course you take in the fall term to kind of prepare you for that interview, interview process and preparing your resume. We have co-op advisors who are there for you to meet with anytime. They have drop-in hours and they can work with you um, regarding any questions with the companies that you're hoping to apply to, or um, if you have questions about, you know, you're preparing for your interview and you wanna do a mock interview or something like that, they can help you with that. These are just some of the um, employers that hire our students. And sorry, just one second. And then as well, we have a specific, um, we call it the resource vault. And in there we have a lot of really detailed information about the different companies. So I definitely recommend that once you apply and you get your CCID, you can go into the resource vault. I can put the, I can put the link in into the chat maybe later um, and get, you can do like a, a deep dive into the different companies uh, that hire our students. Is this one mine too? This one's mine, here to support you, okay. So I've kind of talked about the general parts of the program and the co-op. The, um, the other part I wanna highlight is what my team does. So I have a team of six advisors and two records coordinators. And basically what we're here to do is support you through the rest of your program. So if you have questions, you know, if really if you have any questions regarding your program, you can start with us. We have drop-in hours every day, except for Thursdays. Um, and we're in the DICE building. So when you do and you come and take a tour, you can, we can, you'll hopefully find, find where we are. And we usually have snacks. So, you know, come on by, grab a snack, chat with an advisor. Um, and so basically we, we work with you from admission all the way through till graduation. Uh, and so if you have any questions at all, you can definitely reach out to us. Also wellness supports, if you do have questions about, um, you know, sorry, sorry, if you have questions about wellness supports, we can um, direct you where to go on campus as well for those types of supports, either, either virtual or in person. I think that I'm good. Is this mine too? That was great. No, that no. was perfect. Okay. Thank you so okay. much, Jessica, for all of that great information. Yeah. Um, we are now going to pass it over to Kylie and Mikhail to talk to us about the Engineering Student Sur Society, as well as all the student life fun tidbits. Thank you so much, Danielle, for uh, uh, the introduction. But um, so I'm Kylie. I am a student currently at the U of A. I'm in uh, my fourth year of uh, chemical engineering process control co-op, uh, currently working um, at Kiera, uh, which is a midstream downstream natural gas company. Um, and I'm currently joined with Mikhail, who is, oh, sorry, I forgot to introduce my uh, role. I am the director of institutional outreach. Um, and I'm joined by Mikhail, who is our VP external for the ESS. Mikhail, do you want to introduce yourself as well or? Yeah, sure. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, you're good. Awesome. Okay, yeah, so my name is Mikhail, pronouns he, him, il. I'm co-VP external of the Engineering Student Society, and I'm fourth year electrical engineering co-op and a former University of Lethbridge transfer student. Uh, I'll pass back to Kylie. She'll it'll be the one covering and explaining things. Yeah, so uh, to kind of add on to what Mikhail said, um, I am a previous transfer from Keanu, um, and I was in the same boat as all the students here today, um, go, completing their first year at a transfer university or transfer college and transferring to the U of A, trying to get your first year classes done. Uh, but yeah, me and Mikhail are here to talk about uh, the Engineering Student Society and uh, how we benefit uh, you guys. Um, so as the director of institutional outreach and has Mikhail's position of VP external, we aim to help transfer students like you guys transition to the University of Alberta easier, um, uh, better, less stress fee free. Um, we, we help you a lot with, um, if you have any questions or concerns, uh, we help to answer those questions. 
Um, and we even have a Discord channel or a server. Uh, if, I believe it's on the next slide. So the QR code is up there for anyone wanting to scan. Um, and it'll take you directly to our Discord server where you're free to ask any sort of questions. Um, and we're available anytime if you just send a message into your channels and we'll answer right away. But we're here to talk about um, as well what the ESS does for the University of Alberta students. Um, and uh, the ESS, uh, which is the Engineering Student Society, um, we aim to help improve the student life and uh, student advocacy for all engineering students. So if that is planning events for everyone or um, providing uh, academic uh, resources to everyone, uh, we also, multiple portfolios plan events, we also host Gear Week, which is a fun uh, week of games and activities where all the discipline clubs go head to head against each other, which is really fun, um, which it also provides students to get more involved and meet other students. Um, but yeah, the ESS just helps to aim, connect students and help advocate for students. Um, Mikhail, do you have anything to add on to that or? Yeah. Um... Um, just to add on to that, uh, as you can see, the big three things we do is advocacy, community events, professional development. Um, Kylie really covered most things, but what we do specifically for you is um, we do not deal with any of the um, administrative, like purely academia-based side of the transfer process. Um, so. Oh, oh, don't ask us. We'll just send you over to Jessica or Danielle here. What we handle more is trying to tell you more about what the community is like, student life, clubs. We um, have a lot of knowledge on all the different clubs you saw briefly on the previous slide. Um, there's discipline clubs, which um, every engineering in discipline, be it electrical, mechanical, chemical, has a club that represents them on a smaller scale, which you can get involved in or not, and just attend their events, they're intended for you. Um, there's more hobby focused clubs for everyone at the university, um, as well as the big one are the engineering student projects where you get to actually apply technical skills um, in building anything from a robot, a car, um, a rocket, um, or more for civil work on bridge design, I'm by a group such as Engineers in Action. All of those we can provide you information on. Um, and then, yes, the ESS is there as well. And lastly, there's more social mission groups, such as Engineers Without Borders, Diversity in Engineering, which advocate and support people across the world. Um, so, yeah, if you have any questions on all of those things, we have there's that question period. But also later, you can ask on our Discord. Please join the Discord but you can reach us at pretty much any time of the week. And the Discord or the invite apparently says it's invalid. We'll fix that apparently. Thank you for letting us know, but that's pretty much everything. Yeah, so I guess if the QR code doesn't work, just type in the uh, link. So that should lead you directly to the server. I, sorry that the QR code doesn't work. I swear it did, but yeah, just, take a picture of that uh, link and type it into your browser and hopefully that should take you there. Um, if not, I can share the link directly to Danielle. The link doesn't work either. Okay, never mind. Um, we can definitely share that with Danielle and have it sent or Mikhail can send it to the chat there. Um, but yeah, uh, we just wanna um, help expl uh, tell everyone that uh, we're here to help mentor and help guide um, you guys to, from your institution to the U of A. Um, and yeah, I guess that's all that we have from the ESS, so. Thank you guys. Um, sorry, I was just trying to copy the Discord link <laughs> so I could pop it in the chat for everybody to click on there. So hopefully everybody's able to access that. It is in the chat now um should be working if there's still issues please let us know so thank you so much kylie and mikhail for all of that information if you have more questions on student life they are the best people to ask so please ask those questions today if you have them they pop into your head if not hop on that discord 
um, it's a great place to be. It's a great space to have like-minded people around you. So definitely, definitely hop in there. So all students in the engineering transfer program should apply directly to the University of Alberta at uab.ca slash apply before March 1st of your first year in order to begin courses in your second year um, for the fall term start date. So apply by March 1st, document deadline June 15th um, to ensure that your application's in for next fall start. So going over those last little requirements, um, in addition to that minimum 2.3 GPA in your first year, you're still going to require the five high school courses. We require them, but we're not going to be looking at your grade in them. So we're just going to basically make sure that you have them, check them off. That's all. Um, like Jessica mentioned, we have the program selection form where you're going to rank all your discipline choices. That opens on February 1st, closes on April 30th. And that's going to reopen again on that June 1st date and close by the document deadline of June 15th. Um, the link to that program selection form is going to be a checklist item in your application. So once you finish your application, you have your Launchpad account. It lists all of the checklist items, like all of your um, document requirements, as well as this program selection form is going to be in there. So that's where you're going to be able to access that. Um, and then yes, again, document deadline June 15th, apply before March 1st. So as we come to the end of our presentation, there's a few different ways you can connect with us. So for more information about the Faculty of Engineering specifically, you can check out uab.ca slash engineering. There's great information on there for transfer students specifically. Um, and then also information about every single one of the disciplines. You can also book one-on-one -on -one virtual advising for any admissions related questions um, with our recruitment team. Just send an email on over to transfer at ualberta.ca um, or you can head into uab.ca slash advising. There'll be some advising sessions open in there as well. Um, also in that advising webpage, we have Transfer Tuesday drop-in advising sessions that are specific to transfer students. So I will be there. Feel free to drop in in the hour um, and ask any questions you may have. You might be around some friends that have the same questions. So we can answer multiple questions at the same time. Also, any emails, please email us at enginfo at ualberta.ca. We're more than happy to answer any questions you may have that pop up after this date. Um, and yeah, so please, we're going to start our Q&A session now. Please ask any questions you possibly have that may pop up in that Q&A session box. Um, you can type them in anonymously. They don't have to have your name attached to them and we can try and answer them to the best of our abilities. You have some great resources here for student life with Mikhail and Kylie, as well as specific admissions related questions for transfer students from Jessica. Um, so yeah, we can answer those. We already have one in there, which is great. I already have a CCID. Will I have to use a new one? Um, I know that there's been some rule, like when, I guess if you, if you mean you've just applied and so you have your CCID or if you were a previous U of A student with a CCID. So, um, I'm not sure. I don't know, Danielle, if you know the answer to this, I know that there's a period of time where your CCID like expires and then you would get a new one. Um, I would just apply and then behind the scenes, your your application and your CCID are supposed to get linked up. Um, yeah. If it's different, then I guess you have a new CCID, but use the one that you get when you apply this time. Yeah, so if you use the exact same email you used on your first application, I think they'll all link together on the back end. Um, if you use a different email and you get a new CCID um, and you remember your old one, you can contact IST and they should be able to link everything together because I had to do that when I got my job. Um, but otherwise, yeah, you should most likely be able to use your same CCID. Um, and all questions, you're going to go into the question and answer section. So there's a little Q&A in the black bar. So you're going to pop any questions in there. Um, and then can we expect a co-op program to pay for our tuition or more? 
Um, so I'm not a hundred percent sure if I'm getting, if I'm understanding the question. So if I'm not, let me know. Um, but the, because you're in school for another year and your co-op terms are a course at the U of A, your tuition is more as a co-op student, um, because you have the five co-op work terms in your program. All of the other academic courses are the same as the traditional route. Um, but as you are taking an extra year in your program, it does cost more. Um, your pay during a work term, it really varies from your first work term to your fifth work term. Um, so I don't know, you know, I don't really have the answer to that if it would completely cover it, but yes, it costs more. Typically students do make more money as they progress through their years of learning too. So like you're going to make more money in your co-op in your fifth year of the program versus your year in the second year of the program as well. Do we have an average of how much money students can expect to make for co-op? Um, I think it's, I mean, it's, it ranges from minimum wage to 30, $40 an hour, I believe, but I, it really depends on the company and yeah, you will be working full-time hours though. Uh, another one, I have the equivalent of English 30-1 for McEwen, but not the actual thing. Does this affect me? I would suggest to email, email yeah. for that one. We'd have to look into it further. Yeah, so email us with a specific course. The best email I would say is the enginfo at ualberta.ca. Um, otherwise, yeah, just send that one. That's the best place to probably check it out. I can look at, I'm going to look for the vault um, link and I'll put it in there because that will definitely help you with your engineering discipline um, resources, but as well, I believe there's a lot of information on our, on our engineering main website as well. Yeah. All of those discipline pages should be linked on, uh, through the resource vault. So those are good spot. Yeah. But I do think, or do you not, I'm, I think you need a CCID to get in there. So after you apply, you should have access, but yeah, I'll just find that. Um, so any questions in terms of registration um, or like application or anything like that, the best place to go is enginfo at uolberta.ca. Um, if we can answer the question directly, we'll reach out to Jessica's team and they will get the question, question answered for you. Um, and then for engineering student services, maybe you could pop your email in the chat as well, Kylie um, or Mikhail. And if you have any questions in terms of that, you can go directly to them. Mm -hmm. Any resources to help choose an engineering discipline? That resource vault um, link that I just put in to everyone, that's the best place to go. Um, or check out the uab.ca slash engineering page. Lots of info for each of the disciplines on there as well. Um, great place to start. Um, approximately how much is co-op tuition compared to normal? I'm not I'm not a hundred percent sure. Yeah, I would check out um there's a cool cost calculator. So if you just Google University of Alberta cost calculator, um you can get a good average cost of what it's going to be because you can put in specific co-op program and everything like that. So that's a good average or way to get an average cost. Um, other than that, it's going to be specific to your program and you can change the cost depending on your textbook cost and things like that, your cost of living. So it's all going to vary quite a bit. Uh, what is a C minus in percent range at the U of A? Um, I think it depends on the course, but it's usually, I think, around a 60%. Um, but yeah, we use, we use the grades that are on your transcript. So if, if your courses are on a four point scale, um, we're not going to change that or convert it. If it's in the four point scale already, which is a C minus is a pass, um, for, or a C minus is 
what you need to have the course transfer to the U of A, then we're gonna use what's on your transcript. How does the virtual reality welding work? I don't know. <laughs> when you said that, that was the first I'd heard of it. So I don't know. <laughs> Maybe one of the- Mikhail, do you either, yeah. <laughs> either of you know about this? Uh, unfortunately, I do not know anything about virtual reality uh, welding. So <laughs> I apologize. Yeah. Nah. <laughs> it's a new fangled course or program or something that you'll be able to take. Um, if there's a, if it's a course and there's a professor associated to it that you can see, I'll just reach out to them maybe, and they might be able to answer you more specifically on that one. Um, what master's degrees that are adjacent to engineering are offered? Um, so I'm, I only work in undergraduate, so I, I probably can't help too much with this answer, but I mean, we have master's degrees in all of the, all of the discipline areas. So, um, you know, we have mechanical, then the chemical materials are together and then the electrical, which computer engineering is also under there. And then civil, civil and environmental and mining and petroleum are under that. So all four of the main department, well, five, we have biomedical now as well as a separate department. All five of those departments will offer master's degrees. Um, and I believe, yeah, I don't want to say anything else on there because I'm just not a hundred percent sure, <laughs> but yes. <laughs> it's a whole nother world, the master's section. <laughs> um, do you have to do the degree in four years? five years with co-op or can you take more time to complete it? Great question. Oh, I'm so glad that you asked this question because it is something that I usually mention in my part of the presentation, but I didn't today. So um, no, you do not need to stick with the um, four or five year timeline. When you get into your discipline, which will be fall 2024, you have six years from fall 2024. So we don't include this first year. You have six years to complete your degree, whether it's traditional or co-op. So um, for traditional students, it's an extra three years. For co-op students, it's an extra two years. Um, so some programs are easier to um, spread out than others. Um, but yes, you can, you can, with proper planning, extend your program um, if you'd like to have a lighter course load. And to continue in the program, you only need to be in good academic standing. So we don't have these same rules after every year. It's just after first year to get into your discipline. Great question. Um, will there be another meeting similar to this one as we get closer to the end of first year? So we don't have one planned specifically as a group setting. Um, I know I have some planned specifically with some of the universities um, or colleges that we have transfer agreements with. So check out with your professors to see if I have one like that planned. If not, ask them for it. Say, I want one from Danielle <laughs> and I will do a virtual one specifically for your program. Otherwise, if you want a meeting specifically for yourself, um, to kind of talk through some of this stuff, please book virtual advising. We're more than happy to talk through this with you. Um, otherwise, the next presentation we typically do um, in terms of transfer students is our registration 101 session. So once you're admitted, we will help you in the process of registering for your classes. Why is co-op five years long? Can you do work between the holidays, April to September? Mm. Okay, so co-op, there are no breaks in the program. So for the, the next, well, for the four years, four additional years after first year, you are either in an academic term or a work term. So, um, and it's not always in the, in the summer months. So you may have a program where you have two academic terms, fall and winter, and then you go out for an eight month co-op work term. And then you come back for an academic term in the next winter, and then you go out for a four month work term, or you have another academic term. So um, the structure of the co-op program 
is that, yeah, you're either going to be in school or out on your co-op work term. So you aren't going to have any breaks to your program with the exception of the holiday break, the winter break and reading week. I mean, the, the normal kind of breaks, but no, no summer break. Does the GPA penalty for insufficient credits only apply to getting into the chosen discipline or does it affect other aspects such as scholarships? No, it doesn't affect anything else. It's only an internal calculation that we do to place you into a discipline. Um, recording of this video, I will most likely send out an email with the recording of this video, some links in there as well that we've shared today. Um, and you can find that most likely in the next week or so. Um, and yeah, anybody who's registered will get the recording as well as some links, as well as the Discord um, to join all of that. What's the competitive average for each of the disciplines? Um, so we, we don't know what the competitive average is going to be for each discipline because it can change quite a bit year to year. Um, the, competi the competitiveness of the program is going to be um, based on the number of students that you know choose that program as their first choice and as well as how many how many spots we have in the program so some programs like mechanical engineering are very large programs um, so they might not be as competitive well except for biomedical because biomedical is a very small program within mechanical so it it, it can fl fluctuate so much each year that we don't actually disclose what the previous year's averages are because we don't want that to affect the um, your rankings in any way. It would I would hate to have a student who you know somebody a friend of a friend told them that you needed to get a you know three point five to get into um, civil engineering and then so they don't put that because they don't have that GPA and they put it much lower on their list and they would have gotten into it. So um, don't make your rankings based on what you think you can get into. Um, base your rankings on what you, what you want to get into, what you hope to, to specialize in, in, in the disciplines. There are no other questions in the Q&A right now, but we'll wait a couple minutes to see if anybody has any lingering questions. I know this has been a lot of information today. Um, it can be a little bit overwhelming as well. And again, if anything pops up after this, where you thought of something you wish you asked, please email, please ask us. I do have another thing I want to add that I forgot to mention about co-op. Mm -hmm. So um, besides the 2.3 minimum for co-op, if your first language is not English, um, then you may also, you will, you will also need to meet the spoken English um, proficiency. So just be aware of that. It will be a checklist item on your application and we need to have that in by the document deadline, ideally by April 30th. Um, but yes, we will need that in by the document deadline if your first language is not English. And if you have questions about SEP or um, how to meet that and the English language proficiency, there's information on the website. I am recording this session um, right now as well, so it will be sent out later to everybody who registered for this. I will send an email to everybody um, with this so you can refer to this information later. Yeah. A lot of this information too is on that engineering webpage. You might have to dig for it a little bit sometimes, um, but it is all on there, so you can definitely find it. Um, are we only allowed to take the courses we are told to take in our engineering programs, or could we take things like French, Spanish, etc.? In your first year, um, the agreement that we have with the transfer institutions is you do have to stick with the 12 courses. So there aren't any option courses in your first year. You take um, uh, all the courses and then the English, English 199 equivalent course. Once you're in a discipline, all programs do have at least one complementary studies elective and um, language courses can 
meet that requirement. Some programs have up to three complementary studies electives. And then you also have an ITS elective and program electives. So that's where in your program you can, you can kind of tailor your program a bit to your interests. Um, but that's only starting in second year. Um, I've done two years at the U of A, but I didn't complete my first year. Can I still apply? I think we'll need to look into that further. Yeah, so I would send us an emailing. Yeah, I would send us an email mm -hmm. with a little bit more information on your specific situation. Um, and then we can help you out on that one specifically. everybody a couple minutes. Uh, the best email would be that enginfo at ualberta.ca. Um, and then we can forward you on if there's more specific answers that need to be done by Jessica's team and their advisors. Um, so the one that's right on the screen in the middle there is the best place. Any last burning questions? Oh, yep. <laughs> um, if we don't get into our top choices for engineering disciplines, are we out of luck and have to go into some other discipline we don't like, or is there another option like waiting a year? Okay, so this is a good question. Um, so if you meet the requirements, you will be placed in a discipline. You're not guaranteed your top choice. But I think it's something like 80% of students get in their top three or top five choices. So, um, I mean, that's a, a good way to think about it is it's most likely you're going to get something in your top top five to top 10 at the, at the most. Um, do you have to stay in that discipline or can you wait another year? I mean, you would have that choice. You could you could apply, like as long as you don't take any courses the next year, you could apply again. You'd be ranked and placed into a discipline. It might be the same discipline. It might be something different. It really just depends on, on the applicant pool that year. Um, but you wouldn't be able to take any courses in that year off because that will affect your, your transfer to the U of A if you start taking other academic courses. Um, the other option is to continue with the discipline that you get placed in. And then after your second year, there is an option to apply to change your program. So um, we have a lot of detailed information on our website, but basically how it works is we would take your second year average. You would have to take at least eight courses in your second year that are part of the discipline that you were admitted into. And then you could apply to um, change programs for the following fall. So it would be, I guess, for you fall 2025. Um, you know, there's risks in that, in that you, you know, if you only take eight courses, but your second year is supposed to be 12 courses, you would be behind in some of your courses. Um, but, you know, a lot of students do want to take the lighter course load so that they can, you know, hopefully do better, better in their classes with the lighter load. Um, and then as well, it will most likely extend your program by that year. So some of the courses you're taking may be part of the new program you're getting into, but usually it does extend a student's program by one year. Great question. We have another about five minutes. So we'll leave the floor open for a few last lingering questions. Anybody have any student life questions? We have some two students here. <laughs> They're more than happy to give you lots of answers on that kind of stuff. I know they do some super fun activities during the year. I'm always jealous of all those engineering students. So what? 
Okay, well, oh, one more. <laughs> Any advice to not die with heavy course loads? <laughs> Maybe that could be from Kylie. Or yeah, Kylie or Mikhail, do you want to help out with that one? Yeah, um, so I can talk about uh, when I was back in uh, their position. Um, and first year was a very tough year. And very stressful um but um you just gotta not be stressed and I know it's a hard thing to say to people like just don't be stressed but you you really gotta like like you do the work you put in the effort but then just don't be stressed and if you know you could put in your 100 percent and that was your 100 percent you give give all you could then don't be stressed about if like if, oh if I did bad or if I did good because no matter what, it, it doesn't matter in the sense, like the grand scheme of things. Like once you get in, I guess it's good and you don't stress. Personally, I, I know it's not a great thing to say, but I guess it's the truth from uh, a transfer student as well. But just take lots of breaks and uh, mental breaks and keep your mental health healthy. And um, yeah, don't don't stress out. It's not worth the stress when you have wrinkles, when you're in your mid twenties. Um, Mikhail, do you have anything? I'm, I mean, in not that it's a bit late for this semester or, but, um, for next semester, um, definitely, um, as, as you may have seen, um, when it comes to your classes is your, your first week or so will be a bit slower or, um, it's really important that you don't fall behind early because I personally, um, multiple times, have faced the domino effect of, of falling behind at the start. Um, it's really hard to catch up, um, and that makes life a lot harder. Um, so definitely just don't procrastinate it at the start. Take that little time at the start so that you don't have that huge issue of having to go days on end trying to catch up later on that's my biggest advice um as i face the difficulty of not doing that and let me tell you it's not fun <laughs> fair I enough like i also feel that where i i fall victim to uh not showing up to certain classes at the start and then uh yeah i guess <laughs> I could have used that advice in my first year too. So I like that. Don't, don't get behind. Also ask when you need help, right? You have fellow students in the same boat. You have definitely resources on the U of A campus to help you once you're here. Um, just ask, ask for help to whoever you can. Your professors are more than happy to answer questions. Um, I know a lot of them love to have conversations about the things they're teaching because typically they really love them. So that's another one. Um, I've heard the dodgeball league at U of A is intense. <laughs> is that true? <laughs> it is quite intense. It's um, so, I have a funny story about dodgeball. Go for funny, it. Not funny. <laughs> dodgeball, yes. I, I didn't play dodgeball, but I see students after the dodgeball, the intense dodgeball games in my office because they have dislocated their shoulder, broken their wrist, broken a finger or two. So they have to, you know, get some accommodations with their courses. So um, I'm not saying that you shouldn't join the dodgeball team. I mean, it's supposed to be super fun as well, but yes, it is intense. And I see multiple injuries every year. <laughs> <laughs> It's very competitive, but it is super fun, super fun team building. Um, yeah, the Lister Dodgeball League is a lot more intense than the on-campus Dodgeball League. So if you live in Lister, which is typically a first-year residence, but they do have some upper-year um, places as well you can stay in, you will get the 100% taste of the Dodgeball League. I lived in Lister for two years. It was crazy. Um. Are there TAs in your course? What is their role? 
Um, yes, I believe that most courses do have TAs. As for their role, I think it depends on the course. Um, I don't know if Kylie or Mikhail could, could speak to that from the student side, but um, I believe they're also, if you have seminars and things like that, they're often run by the TAs. Um, yeah, I can speak on um, experience of that. Um, so most of my classes, um, for say like you have like an OCHEM class, the TAs usually run the labs and mark your assignments and lab reports. Um, for other classes, like my higher up um, engineering classes, um, the TAs will often teach your seminars and as well mark your class, uh, your assignments, your midterms, stuff like that. So they are there for any questions you may have. So you're allowed to bug them as as much as you want. Uh, they may get a little annoyed of you, but uh, that is their job. So don't feel bad about bugging them. Um, but yeah, they're there to ask questions to help you with your assignments, mark your assignments. They will be there at your seminars and labs is from my experience what they do. Yeah, and, and just to add a little bit, um, it is important to familiarize yourself with the structure. Um, same, same kind of applicability to where you're at now, how, where you, know, you look at the syllabus. Um, most courses is have numerous TAs. Um, and for those with labs, LIs, lab instructors, um, and some of them are for specific days. Some of them are for specific tasks. So um, make sure you familiarize yourself. With that, so you're not emailing the wrong one. Um, the important, the main distinguishing is there are your lecture TAs, which, as was said, it is more so the grading side of your assignments. You email them um, questions there, or if you think there was a mistake with the assignment marking, you usually message them first. Um, and then, and for your labs. The TAs there usually serve as your direct people and also do the grading there. Um, and they serve under the lab instructor LI who kind of handles the whole lab, um, though each day may have different labs. So there's different TAs then. So familiarize yourself with those ones specifically. Um, but that's the main thing there with TAs and LIs. Uh, another question, what are class sizes like and how much does it vary by course or discipline? Um, a lot. It varies a lot. Like some of your classes are going to be huge, um, much bigger than what you're used to at your at your current institution. Um, but then, you know, once you get into your labs and your seminars, you, you know, you're just going to be like a regular sized classroom of students. So, um, I think it's still true that your classes get smaller and smaller as you progress through the program. So, you know, you're going to bypass the really huge classes maybe with being at your institution. That's a real benefit of, of transferring from, from um, one of our transfer institutions. Um, you still will have some very large classes in the second year, um, but they do, you know, they do gradually get smaller and smaller the more specialized um, they are. I don't know if Kylie or Mikhail has any tips on transitioning into these larger class sizes for students. Yeah, um, I mean, uh, everything that Jessica said uh, is quite true. Um, so you take most of your heavy, large classes in your first year, like um, all your intradisciplinary ones, like your chemistry, your math, you have that all with any other student. Um, but when you get into your second year, um, there's some classes that are overlapping between disciplines. So your mechanical friend and you as a chemical may have thermodynamics together and there's three different class options and uh, there's three different lab options. So it gets kind of tough when you have to choose which class you want to go into. Uh, but sometimes um, there are conflicts which don't allow you to choose which lab or class times you are going to attend. Um, but I can like, Transferring from small classes to large classes is kind of tough. You don't know where to sit. You don't know who anyone is. But um, my um, advice, I guess, would be to go and make a friend. Go and ask, hey, is anyone sitting here? And you make a friend. I've made so many different friends in all my classes in my second year doing that, where you just walk up to someone who's also alone and you say, hey, can I sit here with you? So and you eventually chat and 
find out that you guys are in the same discipline and you didn't even know. So, um, but um, it is also true for uh, when you get in upper years, your class sizes do decrease. Um, I think my class now is about 30, 40 students in the classes. Um, and especially now my cohort's kind of broken up into different um, co-op lengths. So I won't see all my buddies until I, until my last year. Um, but uh, yeah, um, Mikhail, do you have anything to add on to that or? I mean, you pretty much covered everything. Um, for those who are more so introverted, um, definitely take advantage of the fact that second year does have those more generalized courses um, where all of you, you from your same transfer program will be there and you will kind of still get to um, sit with the people you spent this year with. Um, um, it can also serve as an opportunity where you can meet new people with people you already know rather than having to uh, take that burden alone. Um, so that's the big thing. But also once you do find out your discipline and if you are like a big social circle with your transfer group, figure out what ev discipline everyone is in, find out who's in the same one as you or at least the same department um, as you will be having more classes together um, than others and you can utilize that as a starting point. I love that. Also in your larger classes, you don't always have to ask or answer questions. So treat it like a movie theater. You're just there to learn, listen. That's how I treated some of my classes. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, sorry, I just wanna uh, add quickly. Um, so um, me and Mikhail, we're both in some of the same uh, second year classes even though he's in electrical and I'm in chemical um and we met through a mutual friend who I I didn't know was friends with Mikhail and yeah brought us together to be the institutional outreach team but you never know who's in your class until you start making friends so it's always good to start making buddies in your classes I love that and then you can attend some events together exactly <laughs> Um, do students get a chance to ask questions to professors often during class or outside of class? Um, so I think, again, that will depend on the class. All instructors will have posted office hours. So um, if you weren't able to, you know, catch your professor after class because you have to run to another class or, you know, there wasn't time during the class for, for your professor to answer questions, you can definitely um, go to their um, office hours. So they'll, they'll have that in the, in your course syllabus. And, um, yeah, I think that they, I don't know what the minimum is, but there's, you know, there's a certain minimum availability that they need to have. Um, some instructors are really, uh, really great with email. Some aren't, you, you might not ever hear from them. So it just depends on the instructor. Just try to reach out in any way possible. And if all else fails, you can talk to the TAs um, or show up to their office hours. They're not scary. I get a lot of students <laughs> in my office. I don't want to go with I'm scared. No, they're just, they're like everybody else. They're like Danielle said, they're passionate about the work that they do most of the time. And um, yeah, they're there to help. Okay. Maybe I'll give one minute for any other questions that may pop up. Thank you for asking so many great questions. Okay, well, um, if there are no other questions right now, oh, <laughs> after applying, when would we get our CCID? I'm not sure how long it takes. It doesn't take that long. It has to go through kind of the initial steps of the, um, through, through the registrar's office, but 
Yeah. I don't think it takes very long at all. You might not get it until you get your admission letter. I know sometimes it's indicated oh. on there, your letter, your offer of admission, um, but you will have access to the Launchpad account. Um, and if you do get your CSC ID earlier than your offer of admission, then it would be on your Launchpad account as well. So any information will be communicated to you through there. Okay, so I'm just gonna wrap us up here. Um, any other questions, please do reach out to us um, via email to ask. Also on that transfer student discord, I know they're constantly um, answering questions. So please hop on there um, and ask all the questions you have, get your student life <laughs> kind of questions answered. Um, bug Mikhail and Kylie as much as you want to <laughs> because they are there to help all of you. Um, so thank you so much for joining our session today. Um, we did really enjoy answering all of your questions and getting to chat with all of you. Um, and yeah, I hope everybody has a wonderful evening. <laughs>